Okay, everyone. Today we have Tony Martin. He was a legend and he just recently retired. This guy could time trial, four time world champion, silver medalist in the 2012 Olympics in London. But this guy was so multi dimensional. He could win stage races, he could do lead out trains. I mean, he could do everything. Jens, what a great chat with, with Tony today, right? Absolutely. What a great chat. And underneath this humble, friendly man he is, he is a really hard worker and a man made out of iron. There's one or two stories he was sharing with us where it just blew my mind. Yeah, he is he's a tough cookie. There's no doubt about it. Um, super excited to have him on. It did take a while because he's so busy with his new bike project for kids that he'll tell you about at the end of the show. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our conversation with Tony Martin. All right, everybody. Today we have Tony Martin on Bobby and Jens. Tony, welcome to the show. Hey, Bobby. Nice to be here. Man, I tell you, it's been a while. Um, you know, I, I remember tour California days, we'd play poker in the rooms at night and stuff like that. But uh, what have you been up to recently? I mean, you retired in 2021. You look fit as ever. Um, how's life treating you post, post Peloton days? Actually, since I finished my career, I have a really great day. I enjoy, let's say, the, the new life completely. I enjoy being at home, being with my family, Enjoying uh, seeing my, my daughters growing up every day um, compared to the years and when I was pro. And uh, yeah, next to it, I, I've also found my um, yeah my passion now in uh, being also in, a, in another business by developing kids bikes and also next to it, um, yeah, coaching uh, students at school. So um, actually, my, my life didn't get boring. Uh, Actually, it's it's the opposite. It's it's getting even more exciting, and I see different sides of life. And um, be honest with us. When you look at some races in TV, and there's a time trial, you sometimes still feel that little itch. I, I wish I could be there one more time, or you just go, "Nah, it was all good when I was there, but I'm happy on this side of the fence now." I really have to say I'm really satisfied with my career. I did achieve everything I wanted to achieve. Um, I had my my good mo moments. I had my bad moments. And when I look now to the races, I actually I do do often look races uh, with you, uh, Jens, as commentator. Um, I feel absolutely happy to be on my couch and enjoying a glass of Coke or whatever, and uh, yeah, letting me entertain by the other riders. And also in, uh, with the TTs, I mean. Uh, for example, I, I watch now the the Vuelta TT, and I just look at it as a as a or I see it as a fan um, cheering for my old teammates for sure, but also being happy for the other ones when they win. So um, yeah, I really I really um, turned from professional rider to to a cycling fan, and I enjoy every day I can watch cycling on TV. Gosh, that's great to hear, man. I mean, I, I'm the same way. I love watching the races and especially the time trials. So. Give us your opinion of what Filippo Ghana did yesterday in the Tour of Spain. You know, Sepp Kuss defending the, the red jersey. Ghana averaged 56 kilometers per hour over that that parkour. Do you remember ever going 56K an hour in a time trial? I mean, these guys are going so much faster than we used to, right? Yeah, somehow they did. I mean, I, I was also uh, riding against Ghana and also already two years ago, uh, let's say in my, my days, he was also super, super fast. I think in my last words, he gave me more than one minute. But seeing him yesterday going more than 56 k's an hour, um, I was also questioning myself, did I ever make this? But I can't remember, <laughs> honestly. And I think he's another level. I mean, you see it on the world record uh, in the worlds. Uh, unluckily, he was beaten there. Okay, but for sure he will come back. And maybe he still had some, uh, yeah, some angry yesterday in his legs uh, from from the last worlds. I mean, it's not so long time ago. So uh, I think it was a good payback. So when um, when was it for you in your head when it clicked? Hey, I'm good at time trialing. I maybe can become world champion one day. How old were you then? Already at 17, 18 years? Or in your early 20s where you realized, I think I'm world class in this time trial thing? Actually, I loved time trialing right from the first um, day when I started cycling. Um, I started cycling when I was already 
quite old. I mean, I was like 30 years old and uh, there were other riders next to me who had so much more experience already. They started two, three years earlier than me. And when I started cycling, I, I had a lot of problems riding in the peloton. Um, I was not used to ride um, next to other riders uh, going this risk. And I always felt much more confident and safe by being alone on the road uh, in the time trial. And um, yeah, from this feeling, um, with this passion, I, it, it developed uh, into, into uh, something where I also realized, okay, I I'm, I'm don't only feel good there, I'm also, I'm also really strong there. So um, I'm, I'm a guy when I have a goal, um, I don't know don't need anybody else who who motivates me so i when i set a goal from from zero to to the finish um i can give everything without having anybody else in front of me or in back of me who's chasing me and i mean that's the, the biggest problem i think from riders who who are not able to perform well in the tt that they, they maybe have a lack of motivation um by by not having any contender around them and i never had this lack of motivation i always felt good there and uh, soon I started to be um, successful already in the, in the in the youth and the juniors, and from there on, yeah, it was always my goal to to get world champion. Um, but I only realized that I can be world champion was when I when I was training pro. Never before I was never really successful in the in the youth and juniors. I mean, I won some German uh, champion titles, but I performed never so well in the international uh, races. And in my first uh, year professional, I was a seventh from the start uh, in the world. And I realized, okay, sooner or later, I can be also world champion. And you were world champion, not once, but four times. And it wasn't like you didn't have any competition. You know, you had Fabian Conchalera, you had Michael Rogers, you had um, the other German guys, Michael Richt and Bert Gropsch, uh, Rowan Dennis, uh, Tom Dom D Demolan. I mean, four times in in your career, you got to wear the the world championship jersey for a year in the time trials. But recently, we saw Remco Evenepoel beat Filippo Ganna in, for the world championship title, only for Filippo Ganna to reverse that yesterday in the Vuelta. Um, when you win the worlds and you have that rainbow striped skin suit, helmet, bicycle, does that just give you like a totally other gear? Because do you do you expect to win every time trial when you're world champion? Um, after a certain time, yes. After a certain time, <laughs> I um, yeah, I was really disappointed to do, to get second in the TT. So. I remember after my um, my third world champion title, um, I became um, second in. Oh, actually, I don't. Uh, it was in Spain. I don't remember the year, to be honest. But I was second, and uh, Tom Dumoulin won, and I was so disappointed. And I still have this picture in my mind when I was uh, photographed on the podium, and I was uh, looking like uh, somebody died um, because I was getting second and not first. So. The ambition to win every TT uh, where I was started starting uh, was was always there. And um, actually, after my third um, title World Championships, um, the the fight was getting harder and harder. Also, for the motivation, new young riders were coming up. Um, everybody was coming closer. Also, in the development of, of material, um, so yeah, it was harder and harder. And um, when when you are on the top of the wave, it's it's always easy. You're motivated. You're so so full of motivation. Um, you're you're full of confidence. But as soon as you start losing races um, and you 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 fall a bit from your from this top, um, it's, it's getting harder to to surf on this wave. And uh, yeah, um, I had to realize after my third title um, that that eight others came up and asked strong like me or even stronger than me and um, so i i would say i had four or five really great years when i was battling with uh, especially uh, country lara and also wiggins and and michael rogers but then uh, yeah the years of um of yeah of uh, of, of tom dumula of of philip bugana of now evan pool 
they came and I, I was I was fine with that. I mean, that's that's a natural way. Um, you have a certain peak time and then others come and and pass you. Um, but that's that's sport, and I was I was quite happy to to follow up with my fourth title in um, in Qatar at this time. Um, it was quite surprising for me, but I was also full on full of motivation. It was my my. my my course. Um, I had a great team these days uh, with Quickstep who supported me so well. So I was happy with my fourth title, um, having the same amount of titles like uh, Cancellara. And yeah, I still have these four titles and I'm really curious uh, when 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 some rider comes up and break maybe this record. Um, and I hope this will still last a bit, but I'm pretty sure that uh, especially Philippe Gana will break this record. Um, well, let me put a smile back to your face then. I remember two moments in time trial. I mean, you impressed me many, many times, but two time trials. One, you were still a very young and up and coming, and you passed me. You caught me for a minute at the German Nationals and dropped me. Oh, man, I still feel the pain. I couldn't even stay on your wheel when you passed me. So I still feel the pain in myself. And the second time, you won a super hard, complicated, technical time trial in the Tour of the Basque Country, in the rain. You must have pushed like close to 600 watts on your uphill. <laughs> you showed you live on TV, you're doing 85 kilometers an hour downhill in the rain, in the Basque Country, in the city. And like, oh, 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 this is not, oh, this is terrible. And you won it. Dude, these are the two moments they stick out where I go, wow, that was super impressive. You remember both of these moments? We do, but what I also remember, Jens, is um, when you pay, paid it back and you passed me in the Tour of Pologne. I mean, it was in a road race. And I was in a breakaway and you attacked from the peloton and you passed me and let me stay like a stone. So I also remember this moment. But uh, yes, 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 I, I remember these TTs and um, especially, I mean, I actually, I love the TT championships and I also love Pay Basque. Um, even pay bus is always super hard and it's actually only for, for climbers. But somehow I I love this challenge and uh, there were always one or two TTs, mostly one prologue and one uh, pure TT. Even if it was quite hilly, um, I always loved this challenge and um, maybe I, that's why I was always able also to go a bit more risk in, in pay bus, especially with these great uh, fans around us. Uh, I'm pretty sure you both guys remember the, the fans in Pay Bus. I mean, it's just such an amazing atmosphere and that's always pushed me to the limit. Well, I've always said that time trialing is an art form. And as in art, you know, artists have their different style, use different brushes. You had a very particular style of a huge gear compared to some of your competitors that had a much, much higher RPM. How did that develop and why did you kind of stick with that? You were one of the first guys that had massive chain ring and, you know, you were, you were super aero and I know you worked on that, which I want to talk about later, but how did you develop that unique style that did bring you four world championships and even a silver medal in the Olympics? Yeah. I mean, um, Riding with this kind of power, it's it just felt natural for me compared to to have this high cadence, uh, what also also a lot of riders do. But I always like to to have uh, this this low cadence being uh, quite stable on the bike and uh, pushing with the pure power. And um, yeah, for me, it, it it really felt natural by using um, the the fifty eight uh, chain ring. Um, these days when I started this, it was outstanding, maybe also bad cops. My my team uh, colleague were using it, but I think everybody else was using 55 or 56. But when you see it now, uh, yesterday on the Walters um, TT, uh, they were even using 60. So also the development goes further and further. Um, I really have to say, um, I had such a great support these days from Team Columbia and especially uh, Lars Teutenberg and, and Rolf Aldag. They gave me so much advices and they made me uh, test things, test things uh, so much and so often. And um, they, they gave me actually the, the 58 chain ring to, to try it. And I felt so much better than with the 55 or 56. And um, I loved this. And since that, I never wrote a, a, a smaller chain ring. And, uh, 
Yeah, coming to the aerodynamics, um, as I said, especially with Last Teutenberg, we spent so much time on the track in the wind tunnel where we're always um, uh, looking forward to optimize things. And um, I think uh, 10, 15 years ago, that was also uh, not not usual uh, in the business. Um, I mean, it's also not so long ago when you remember um, Jan Ulrich seeing uh, riding a TT with the, with the cap. Uh, and uh, I mean, this size, we, not this style, but um, some kind of um, mentality we also had in 2008 when we were starting, or when I was starting my career. And I think in these days, um, High Road uh, already, uh, yeah, knew that you can make a big difference in in having uh, a leadership in terms of material and and aerodynamics. Um, so I'm I'm looking backwards i uh, or like looking back uh, i really have to say i was super lucky to to start my career in this team um i, I want to go a little deeper into this i believe you were one of the first riders ever using a combination of the carbon rim and the tubeless tire right you wouldn't have the glue on tires anymore but a tubeless tire yeah. And why was that? Better rolling resistant or was it aerodynamically better? And also, didn't you experiment with the big wheels in the, for the derailleur? There were a few little things you were coming up first with. Maybe explain a little bit more to us um, how did that happen and how did the testing go? Yeah, we were testing a lot with the tires. Um, I was, I think, the, the, the first rider who was riding not tubeless but clinchers um, in the TT. Um, and also quite, quite wide tires. So sometimes I was using, um, 28 millimeters because, uh, we found out in the wind tunnel, this is, that this is way more aerodynamic, uh, than for example, the, the 23 or 25 millimeter tire. So we did a lot of testings there and, um, the same, like, uh, with the 58, uh, chain ring, we were one of the, the first teams who were using the, the clinchers. And what we also were uh, using were the, these camel bags in front of the chest. Um, maybe you also remember this because we found out um, the more volume you have uh, around the chest, the more aerodynamic it is. And uh, later on, the UCI forbid it because, uh, yeah, obviously it was not for drinking, it was for making um, a better aerodynamic. But um, this was also one of the, the big adventures that we have in, 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 the, in the past uh, by having yeah, like a bit of a balloon, a balloon in front of the chest. Um, what else have we done? I mean, we tested a lot of um, um, material for the, for, the, for the time price suit, for example. Um, also, 15 years ago, everybody thought, okay, um, a TT suit has to be just tight and that's it. And uh, when there are no um, no welds in, it's it's fine. But uh, uh, we believe that with a different material and on different parts on the TT uh, suit, we can already also make a, a quite big difference in terms of aerodynamic. And so we tested um, uh, a normal TT suit and put um, over the arms, for example, another uh, different material just to test it if it has a po positive effect or not. And um, so we tested, yeah, I would say around five, five to 10 uh, different types of, of, of material on different parts of the TT. And so we found out the, the perfect combination um, for a TT suit. Well, I, I need to ask you about this now, because when I, our, our careers did not overlap. You started, like you said, in 2008, and that was my last season. But I remember seeing you walk down the corridor of the hotel in the Tour of California, and you look like an NFL linebacker. Your shoulders are quite wide, but you were able to collapse your clavicle into one of the most narrow, skinny positions I've ever seen. That doesn't happen overnight, right? Like you had to train your body and stretch muscles that no, most people don't even know they have in order to collapse into that position, correct? Correct, yeah. I mean, it's, it started with also aerodynamic tests in the wind tunnel. Uh, we put at the beginning um, kinesio tape. Uh, so tape actually that you put when you have uh, some some maybe muscle problems or to prevent, to prevent muscle problems. 
uh, we put this kinesio tape all around my shoulders uh, to to put them together and to make it for me easier to to keep them in this position and um, in the in the TT tunnel and it, sorry in the in the um, wind tunnel we found out that this that this is so much more aerodynamic but also not too much because you still have to be able to put your uh, um, your throat and your 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 head <laughs> actually between it or or, or maybe under underneath it. Uh, so I had to find a, a perfect position and um, I also trained it uh, later on in training but also with core training uh, with um, shoulder uh, mobilization for example for with strength um, for for the core for the whole core actually to 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 keep this position so it was a lot of um, training on the bike but also off the bike but I would say after one year it just felt natural and uh, I don't even have to concentrate on this anymore. It was just uh, in in my DNA, and uh, I felt uh, quite, actually, quite relaxed. Even it was a quite extreme um, position. Um, now that we talk about all these uh, tech parts, um, is it true the rumor that you once or twice you taped sandpaper onto your saddle so you you wouldn't move anymore on top of the saddle? Uh, I heard it more than once. What about that? Maybe because I had it on on every single TT that I wrote. Maybe not on every. Um, I started in the first year with um, uh, what is this? It's uh, Velcro. Uh, so um, this material Velcro. that this that's how I started. Yes, it was also uh, an advice of of Lars Teutenberg because I always had this problem um, that I was pulling so hard with my hands to to generate a, a quite nice. Uh, muscle um, loop around my my whole body that was always pulling with my hands my my um, uh, yeah my legs more to the front so I was always um, coming closer to the peak of my saddle and then I was not stable anymore um, to to bring the optimum uh, power um, in, into my legs and um, so we, we were looking for a, for a method to keep my position stable on the on the saddle that I don't uh, slip anymore to the front. So we started with um, this Velcro. Um, we, we clued onto the saddle, and this was giving me some good grip onto the in combination with uh, with the TT suit. But still, I was um, there was too much movement to the front. So we decided to, to give it a try and uh, use some sandpaper. So. I put this sandpaper onto the saddle and then I had a, a perfect stick to the saddle and there was no chance anymore to move to the front and I was so um, yeah stable then um, with my lower body um, that I could generate um, yeah so much power with my legs that I just felt yeah naturally, naturally perfect. The, the problem came when uh, the problem came when the UCI decided uh, that uh, no custom uh, components uh, are allowed anymore on the races. Maybe you know this rule, or probably you know this rule. Um, so every every two, every component that is uh, used on the bike has to be officially uh, be be sold in, in, in any shop. So um, I was uh, talking then to to the saddle supplier. I think it was Physic these days. Um, that we are um, yeah, developing uh, a saddle, um, actually a, a normal uh, yeah, off-the-shelf saddle that I was using on TT bikes um, and where we cut it out um, the middle and uh, put um, by hand, um, handmade uh, sandpaper uh, in the middle. We glue we it and uh, I used this and they offered it in their um, online shop. So I think it was a quite high price where they offered it because it was handmade. Uh, but so we, um, yeah, we were able to, to well, I was able to use um, this saddle um, still sticking to the rules of the UCI and uh, performing well because I still had my sandpaper on the saddle. One time, <laughs> either in your white world champion suit or German champion suit, I saw a lot of red color around your white racing pants please tell me that it was not blood but it was just some shimmy cream don't tell me it was all of that was blood because it was a lot of red color on your perfectly white racing mix please 
explain that, that beer. Please tell me it was just cherry cream. Yes, I, I knew that uh, this question will come up. Um, and uh, sorry, I have to tell you, actually, it was Black. Uh, and it was oh. also in Bay Basque. Um, it was raining and somehow, um, I mean, when, when it rains, some, everybody knows it's, uh, somehow it, the, the irritation is even more uh, there. And um, even it was a quite short uh, TT, somehow, um, yeah, my my TT suit uh, were uh, ripped off on a, on a certain part because of the sandpaper and I got some irritation um, on my ass. Um, but I, to be honest, the pictures looked worse than it was. I mean, I, I had some bloody uh, wound um, on my ass, but it was not, uh, yeah, through the through until the until the um, until the, the the bones or the meat or however it looked like it was just a uh, surface uh, wound and the pictures were stronger than than uh, my pain was but uh, yeah I, um, there was a lot of reaction on it uh, there were some famous pictures that still go around and uh, actually after this I also um, spoke to my supplier of the TT suit that they made uh, one more layer on the on the on the on this area around uh, the seat um, the, the, this uh, this uh, uh, sitting um, area uh, to to prevent uh, these accidents yeah geez I I never knew that um, I think I saw a picture of a skin suit that looked like it was worn out a little bit but yeah blood that's a totally different different level but you know anything for for performance um, sure. Tony now that you're retired I can ask you this and maybe you can share your knowledge with the young men and women that aspire to be better at time trials can you kind of go through your day before a time trial and let's assume that it's a one day time trial not you know the second stage of of Perry uh, of pay Basque right okay. can you walk us through your nutritional pro protocol your warm-up protocol uh, you know kind of like minute by minute um, as best you can, because I'm really curious to hear how detail oriented you were with, you know, waking up at a certain time, eating at a certain time, doing the recon at a certain time, starting your warm up. How long was your warm up um, before so many time trials that you won? Um, yeah, actually, um, my my daily um, my daily plan before TT was was for me always routine. I always had to stick to a certain plan, and the plan looked like that I um, needed my my breakfast um, always around uh, yeah four to five hours before TT. So a lot of riders like to eat uh, um, yeah three hours before. Um, my goal was always to be four or five hours uh, before the TT. Uh, for breakfast, um, then it was always important for me to to go again on the parkour to see the parkour um, and whenever possible in a closed uh, condition so that I was able to go through the corner, especially full gas, so that I can see how far I can go. And uh, mostly I was back um, on the bus. I never went back actually to the to the hotel. I always wanted to be uh, in the start area. I wanted to back uh, to the bus uh, that was already already wow. placed uh, in the start area um, three hours before the race and then I had like a, a second uh, breakfast or first lunch before the TT um, I needed it actually like two and a half hours before the TT um, I, I knew that uh, especially the long TTs I need the power um, I, I, I need a second lunch after the uh, a second breakfast after after the training that already uh, consumed uh, the calories, I needed uh, to fill up my 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 muscles. Um, so I, I I had my second breakfast two and a half hours before, and uh, then I tried to to um, yeah get with my thoughts a bit away from the TT. Try I tried to relax in the in the bus, nobody around me, uh, maybe looking some movies or hear some music. And actually, then I started my real uh, warm-up program, fifty-five to to sixty minutes before the before the actual TT. Um, the warm-up program program was depending on the heat outside, thirty to forty minutes, and I tried to finish this warm-up program around 
um, 15 to 20 minutes before TT uh, to still have like five to 10 minutes, get uh, dressed in the bus, um, getting the, the sweat dry and uh, pulling the cover shoes on and stuff like this. And then uh, I try to be not too early on the start, uh, but also not too late that you don't get stress. Uh, so uh, I try to be like five minutes before the start on the, on the start line. And uh, sometimes they say that at the races, stage races, the sprinters only have a few chances. If you take, for example, this year's Vuelta España, we, we, you know, you watch it also. There's one time trial. So even the sprinters have more chances. Or look at us three, me with my breakaways. I would, in a normal Tour de France, I would have at least five to seven days where I could go on a break. Bobby, as a climber, he would have easy five or six mountain days to go and show himself. But you, as a time trial, you had one, maybe two time trials. Did you feel enormous pressure to get it all right in this one moment? Um, actually, not really. I, I really like this to be focused on one, maybe in the good years, also two uh, time trials. Um, and what I always liked on TT, I mean, you mentioned you had like five to seven chances, but there were so many different circumstances. I mean, it was, was never easy to go in a break. Sometimes they let you ride, sometimes not. Sometimes you have to be the strongest. Sometimes it's just, um, yeah, a coincidence that you are uh, in the in a break. So it's not always on you. That's what I want to say. And in the TT, what I really like is um, it's 100% on you. I mean, where the weather conditions are the same for every rider, but mostly it is. So... Um, it's really worth to focus on this one or two days. And um, I never, yeah, I'm, okay, I felt pressure for sure, but uh, in a positive way. I was always motivated. I felt the pressure from the team. I mean, especially as was world champion, everybody expect that you win or be at least up to, on the podium. But mostly I was able to turn this pressure into something positive, into, into uh, yeah, into power that brought me forward and to to make me able to write uh, the best times um so i liked it that uh, there was there were one or two days where all the focus was on me and where i could say um i do this that and that in preparation and maybe the day before i could take it a bit more easier so um i i, I love this moment yes well, you know, we're, we're talking as if you were one dimensional, but you also won your fair share of stage races during your career, including Paris Nice, the Nico Tour, Algarve, Tour of Belgium. What, what did you have to change in your mentality, maybe your diet, to go from that time trial specialist to a GC contender? I mean, Paris Nice. Not an easy race to win. I mean, you got to get up some hills as well. Yes, um, true. Um, I I was always um, I saw myself always as a as a time trialist, but not as a one and only time trialist. I was always uh, looking for my chances in, especially in, in breakaways. Um, in the years before, the I would say the races were also a bit different. Uh, you had a fair chance uh, by doing a, a really good time trial stage to lose maybe uh, just a few seconds on the, on the climbs because um, the stage races in, in, in these days were maybe not so extreme hilly than they are um, compared to in these days. And uh, I was always able to put uh, the power uh, that I was able um, to produce on the TT also for uh, for a certain time also on 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 hills so especially hills that were uh, less than uh, 10 minutes i was also able to put a lot of uh, power there um, and i was aware that um, there were not many races that i could win but there were a few and i was able to to focus on these races and um yeah to go for it um and um yeah that's why i was always also open for for, for for breakaways in in let's say medium uh, climb races but also to add another dimension tony you were part of a really successful lead out train with kevin this with rancho i believe bernie eisel was there i believe your job was take them from kilometer five until kilometer three or two to go you were like the first big powerhouse to get them closer to the finish 
was it easy for you or you had to grow into it? You had to train to learn it or it was just natural. It was just like a time trial for you. No, also this, uh, I had to learn, um, especially in, in HEC with, uh, with Mark Cavendish and also, um, Andre Kripel, uh, we had two top sprinters there and, um, my, my mentor actually where, where I learned almost everything was, was really Bernard Eisel. He was a perfect road captain. He gave me so many advices, actually it was a bit like PlayStation. He was sitting on my rear wheel and was saying faster, slower, left and right. And I learned so much from him, uh, especially, um, what you need in these days, staying on one side that the, the, the rest of the peloton ca only can pass you on one side, not staying in the middle, that a wave come from the back, um, having the perfect timing. Um, all of these things I, I learned from Bernard Eisel and, um, this, this ex experience that I made there, I could also take into the other teams uh, where I also had to be uh, sometimes in the leader train. Um, but uh, also with by getting older, um, I also felt felt stressed by being in the leader train uh, and to being really in the in the last 5k around all these lead out guys and and sprinters they that that just love to being in this stress and hectic. Uh, it was ever my word. Uh, I enjoyed the time with uh, especially with Kev. <laughs> Uh, but I was also happy when I was off and uh, let the others uh, do the, the rest of the job. Yeah, I mean, the more I look at it, the more I think about it. You were so multidimensional. You could do pretty much anything. But you also have one of the coolest nicknames in in the sport, the Panzer Wagon. Yeah. We all know what that means. But where, who gave you that that nickname, and and when did it come around? Was it somebody like Bernie? No. No, almost. It was actually Brian Holm. Um, he was a spot director uh, in, in Quickstep, and he has he has a fable for for history and especially the Second World War. And um, I mean, everybody knows that also the Germans play an uh, uh, intense role there. And um, he gave us not just me; he also gave uh, Bernard, uh, Bert Krabsch, for example, the the nickname uh, Luftwaffe. But this was all internally, internally. So just when we had some um, meetings, he said, for example, uh, Tony, the Panzerwagen goes from kilometer there and to there because he meant that uh, nobody can pass me. Um, and um, I just go my way. It doesn't matter if there's a tailwind, uh, um, front wind, whatever, a hand wind. Um, so this was, um, yeah, some kind of a joke, but he also, um, was was uh, showing this picture uh, of my characteristic as a writer and i believe there was um one interview from the danish tv uh, where where uh brian said um instead of my name he he, he called me panzerwagen but i think it was not on, on purpose um but uh yeah <laughs> the, the people remembered this and called me from this moment on panzerwagen and then that's actually where the moment when uh, the nickname panzerwagen was was born in the in the let's say outside world outside of the team bus there were a few more i believe um prince harry uh, for yeah. um the australian exactly. um, lead out man Mark Renshaw, yes um so there were a few ones but yeah if it's internal we don't have to leave but, them all out here hey um in your days or in your time at the tour you had so many good moments winning a stage taking the jersey but also one or two crashes if you look back at it which memories comes first to your mind the happy ones the painful ones or all of it together um i'm when i look back to my career there first of all there always come up the this perfect um positive um, uh, memories and that doesn't uh, only mean the the victories i mean i had such a great time um i i, I loved my my life just by being out with the guys um um, with all these cool riders around me, with all these uh, cool teams uh, where I was um, able to ride for. Uh, surely also with those great uh, victories, especially in TT. I mean, I had such great moments. And uh, yeah, these crashes, and I believe it was one then more, one or two. And, but uh, yeah, they also belong to the history. Um, luckily, I was always um, able to to stand up again. Sometimes I had to, to go to 
to hospital. Uh, maybe I had to take uh, a break of uh, one to two weeks, but luckily I was always able to continue riding my bike, and that's that's what what stays for me. And uh, I mean, it's a side effect of cycling. Everybody uh, who's who's a professional rider crashes, and um, the goal is always to to go up again and continue the, the race or the training or whatever. And uh, it's part of cycling. Unluckily, um, I think we have to do more um, to to prevent uh, riders from from crashing. And I think there's still uh, potential to do to do so. But um, yeah, it will always be a part of of cycling. Yeah, unfortunately, you're absolutely right there. But talking about a, a very special moment that that I remember was, I believe it was the 2012 Tour de France. You know, they had a prologue, you had a mechanical in the prologue, you crashed, you broke your 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 wrist, but you it was an Olympic year, so you were trying to make it through. I think you finally wound up uh, stopping in the middle of the race, if I can remember. But then, you know, you had the Olympics in, in London on the horizon. You know, those guys, you know, Bradley, everybody came out of the tour and basically it was the next weekend was the, the time trial, but you had to go home and train away from the race with a broken wrist and you still got second a silver medal in the london 2012 olympics how did you do that how did you focus and be able to have the morale to train with a broken wrist and then realize that you're going to be coming out you know maybe a little bit short against those guys that finished the tour de france that had to have been a real mental battle for you yeah actually it hasn't been a real battle because i was so so motivated for the olympic games i mean where my my first olympic games and uh, i've always had this fight for the gold medal in my head and yes there were this bad crash on the second stage but actually there were never a question mark that i would go full gas until the olympics and into in the olympics and uh Luckily, I was still able to continue uh, with a broken wrist. Um, I had a super medical support there and also the physios uh, were treating me so well that I was really um, able to survive. I think it was eight more stages, always on the last position of the of the peloton um, because I was not um, really able to 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 hold uh, my handlebar proper. So I really I always had to keep some distance to, to, to the front guys. Um, but yeah, what I said, there was never a question to to give up and to um, to focus um, on on races when the risk was maybe uh, was healing. Um, I always saw my chance, and um, I was um, yeah coming um, home then after the f the first um, uh, rest day, and um, yeah, I was still training on my TT bike, and uh, yeah, having some 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 pain, but um, I. I was just focusing on 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 the Olympics, and uh, what gave me some extra boost was when I when I when I felt this Olympic spirit uh, coming to to London. I was uh, so amazed by 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 London, by by the atmosphere there, by the fans. Uh, they they really brought me uh, to the silver medal, and, and at the end, uh, yeah, the silver felt like like felt like gold, and um, it was it was a super nice story, and I'm happy that I that I uh, went through the pain and uh, yeah, stick to the plan to go uh, full in for the, for the Olympics. So I have another crash related question because there's a lot of mystery and rumor about it. You famously once you, you, you crashed unlucky in a yellow Jersey and for a long time, there were rumors or that you had the ID to finish the race you did. Get a jet, fly to Belgium, get a collarbone operated, fly back to the team hotel and start the next day. How realistic? Let's say on a scale from zero, zero to 10, yes, we did it. How likely, how close were you to actually do that crazy stunt? Uh, yes, let me say it like this. If the doctors would give me the okay, I, w I would 100% uh, do that. I was so disappointed uh, to, to leave the race in yellow Actually, not not only for me, for the, for the whole team. Uh, when you see the the story behind this yellow jersey, we were um, fighting one week, always so close for the yellow, and then uh, we achieved it um, by some seconds. And then 
losing it again by a crash um yeah that felt so wrong and leaving the team felt so wrong and um unluckily the it, it was an open probe so uh, an open fracture so um the the risk to get an infection into it uh, was so high that um, the doctors definitely said no to for a restart um still in the night i was flown by a private jet from from quick step uh, uh to hospital and i actually i had the surgery uh, in the morning afterwards so actually from the timeline it would have been possible to restart again but uh, yeah the doctor said they were it was too critical and yeah then i then i yeah i i i have to follow this advice um but if there would be any any chance to to restart um i would be happy yeah Jeez, Jens, you got all the little good gossip, you know, all the all the little <laughs> intel, calling them out big time. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's funny what goes through our heads when we're hurt, but you've worked so hard for that objective that you don't want to give it up. And just listening and and doing some research, man. Okay, I was not as multidimensional as you. Like, I got the hell out of the re- lead out trains. Um, I wasn't even a part of that. But, like, you won Perry Nice. I won Perry Nice. You won an Eco Tour. I won an Eco Tour. You won a silver medal in the Olympics with a broken wrist. I had the same thing. I mean, Jens had to nurse me through the last 10 stages of the Tour de France and especially along the Champs Elysees, uh, which. Uh, most most people don't realize is is not a road there there's some pave section there and i'm trying to get done and it just makes me think of w- how serious we are when it comes to an objective that you can block out so much so much pain as an athlete but um man tony you know your your career was an amazing one but it recently came to an end after the 2021 year you look fit is a fiddle what are what are your current projects um we see that bike behind you jens mentioned it tell us a little bit about what you're up to now and what's keeping you so fit yeah so actually why i'm still so fit i don't know because i don't have so much time anymore for for riding the bike unluckily um but i still try to sit on my bike yeah twice a week um yeah, what keeps you so fit? So first of all, you mentioned it, uh, Bobby. I have this new uh, project in my life, or actually, it's not so new anymore. I'm I'm into it already almost two years now. Um, I started it together um, with Marcel Kittel and a uh, third old friend, uh, Franz Bleschwitt, uh, where where um, we set the goal to to make the most uh, safe, innovative, uh, um, sustainable bike. Uh, on the kids bike market um, so the idea was born when i was uh, looking for my my daughter's first bike um, i was going through the shops didn't have any clue for about uh, kids bikes and what i found there was uh, let's say uh, yeah not that what i expected uh, from a kids bike where i see my daughter on um, so i was quite disappointed i bought something um, where I was not really convinced about, but I had to do it um, because yeah, my daughter needed a bike. And I had a chat about this uh, with Marcel Kittel. Um, he, he still um, lived these days uh, in my neighborhood and we still were training together a bit. He already was retired. I was in my last year. And um, actually he made the same um, experience uh, when he bought um, a, a bike for his son. So yeah, actually the, then the, the idea was born, okay, let's try to make it better, try to start uh, with the concept from the, from the white paper on. And uh, yeah, we convinced our, um, our friend Franz uh, to join us. And um, on, the, on the Euro bike, it's one of the big, uh, biggest expos uh, regarding bikes in Europe. Uh, we started in, in, in autumn 21 uh, to to, to look there for some support from the bike industry and we could convince uh, some great partners. And since that, uh, we developed our concept. We were um, ready for industrialization um, right now. So we are just starting to produce uh, this bike, um, which has a special focus on uh, safety, first of all, because actually we all knew as uh, bike riders how how important safety in traffic is, and especially for our kids. And um, 
for, our, for us, the, the key factor um, being the safety and traffic is um, visibility. So um, our, our goal was to um, yeah, integrate a, a 360 degrees light system into the bike um, so that um, yeah, the, the kids are quite visible um, from, compared to other kids' bikes. Um, and especially when you think about um, the moments when car drivers look more on the on, the, on their mobiles than on the traffic, it's even more important to have uh, this visibility in traffic. So um, we are working on this concept. Um, we are just in an industrialization phase and um, yeah, we will be on the dealer shop with our bikes uh, Eastern uh, 24 or so in almost, oh no, in a good half, half of year. Uh, so what's the name of your company? What's the name of the bike model? And you plan to have a perfect parent's bike as well? or have one of these Strider bikes, yeah. Laufrad. You also plan to have one for the very little ones. And what's the name of the project? What did you ask, <laughs> Jens? So it's it's Lion bikes, but Lion not from uh, the Lion, the animal. It's it's from Light On. So it's this uh, double point in the middle. So um, we also want to wear this this focus of visibility and already in our brand. And um, for the moment, we plan the bike uh, for for kids that have the first uh, rides alone to school. So we start with our bike from, from seven years to 11 with a, with a smaller model and the bigger one will be from 10 to 14 years old um, uh, pupils because we think that these young riders need uh, the biggest support in traffic because we all know kids don't behave as they sometimes should in traffic, they make mistakes. And we have to give them some support uh, in these situations. Uh, so we we decided uh, to start with this size of, of bikes. Um, but um, when when whenever we show these bikes to the kids, but also to the parents, there comes directly the question from the parents: Oh, uh, will you also offer this bike uh, for for adults? Uh, so we have already the plan uh, in our mind also to to grow with our brand to to support uh, not just um yeah actually the the, the kids um uh, from from seven years old we also want to support uh, older youth and uh, even also parents and and adults who also like our design and like the concept um but this will be the second step first of all we focus on the on the kids that uh, go with the with the bike especially to school or to their friends and we want to motivate them to go with our cool looking bike um and um, yeah, we 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 are also sure that that also the kids, not only the parents, also the kids will like our bike. It's some kind of BMX style, uh, but combined with an integrated light system. So I think it has this combination from um, coolness factor, but also safety factor. Wow, that that's genius. Um, I recently, well, the last four or five years started riding around with a Garmin Varia tail light and headlight. And I tell you, I really feel that that has saved me from a lot of issues that pop up. So that this is integrated into a kid's bike, that's yeah. that's genius. Uh, we wish you all the best with that project. And, you know, our listeners and viewers now know where to find it. So, Tony... Thank you so much for coming on, Bobby and Jens. It was great to catch up. I mean, you are a legend of the sport, overall nice guy, and we just can't thank you enough for finding some time today to come on to our podcast. Thanks a lot, Jens. Thanks a lot, Bobby. It was a pleasure to be here, and I uh, hope to see you soon again. And Jens, also to you, thanks for all the nice moments uh, as commentator. Great job, and uh, guys, wish you all the best for the future. Well, that's all the time we have again for this week, folks. Huge thank you to Tony Martin for being our guest. Thanks a million for listening. And please give us a five-star review and share us with your friends. The show was a Velo production in association with Shock Giraffe. This episode was produced and edited by Mark Payne. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and Facebook. Just head to Bobby and Jens and send your cycling questions to us. We heard a lot about Tony's commitment and his incredible willingness to put his body on the line for victory. Let us know by messaging us on social media 
at Bobby and Jens. <laughs>